Welcome. It's nice to have you here. I hope you enjoy it. I think you will. You're listening to the Jam Session Podcast. I was told that I could listen to the radio at a reasonable volume. With Cowboys insider... What's your name? Jean-Jacques Taylor. That's my name. Radio personality and craft beer expert, Matt McLaren. He's a very strange young man. He's an idiot. Comes from upbringing. And now, the Jam Session Podcast. It is indeed Jam Session. Subscribe, rate, and review, and hang out with us for a while. Right here on Jam Session. The moment we've all been waiting for has arrived. Ladies and gentlemen, the radio, TV, and now podcast star, the sexy Jean-Jacques Taylor. What up, though? It's me, the non-sexy one, Matt McLaren. And this is the Jam Session Podcast version 14, asking simply that you prepare to be dazzled. If not entertained. Also, definitely want to take a moment here to thank our sponsors that are making the Jam Session podcast possible. We wouldn't be able to do it without our sponsors. So please, if you get a chance, support these guys because they're supporting us. And we have a couple of new sponsors. One of our newest sponsors is Blue Star Motor Group, a local husband and wife team that has a combined 50 years of experience in the car business. They specialize in superior quality Carfax certified pre-owned vehicles of all makes and models. Super simple, aggressive pricing. If you need to sell your car, give Deb a call with Blue Star Motor Group. Want to know the value of your car retail versus the wholesale? Give Deb a call. You can check them out on Instagram and see their customer reviews and get some more information. But I would also encourage you, check out their website at bluestarmotorgroup.com. You'll see inventory and pricing. They'll get you taken care of. Again, that's bluestarmotorgroup.com. They're big fans of Jam Session, and we appreciate them jumping on board. Also, welcome to Freeway Tire Shop. Easy to get to in Dallas. It's right off of I-35. JR and the guys at Freeway Tire Shop are going to take care of you and your service needs. They're doing everything, man, from state inspections to oil changes, alignments, general mechanic work, and, of course, tires. I mean, Freeway Tire Shop. Competitive pricing and elite customer service. They're going to take care of the Jam Session audience. So let them know that you heard about it on Jam Session and get over to Freeway Tire Shop for all your car service needs. You can check out what they have going on at FreewayTireShop.com. Schedule an appointment, request a quote, request a quote. Again, FreewayTireShop.com. And I don't know that we were entertained or dazzled much tonight by what we saw as we record this late on a Sunday night. The Cowboys officially lose as we figured they would to the Philadelphia Eagles in a game that, I mean, my God, was this an ugly game to watch. I mean, it was, but, I mean, it was an ugly game to watch, but I found it to be an interesting game because uh, the Cowboys, as bad as it was, you know, at least they were in it. It was probably, probably their, their one of their, it was their best defensive performance of the year. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, you know, it. I kept waiting for a spark and they were almost there a couple of times, but just couldn't quite get it where they needed to go. So, you know, I mean, you know, I've told y'all, man, my expectations are what they are. Right. There ain't no style points here. So they played hard. They just, they ain't good enough right now, bro. That's why I said, you ain't got a tank for Trevor. They're not very good right now. <laughs> man, you know, and, and, and we're going to get into both sides of the ball. Obviously, as you mentioned, the defense, which, you know, hey, thanks for playing Carson Wentz and his four turnovers. But, man, this offense, it's wild because when Dak was the quarterback, it was a team that could just gobs of yardage, could go right down the field, put up points. And ever since they've lost Dak, you're looking at a team that struggles to score touchdowns at all. They don't tonight. All nine of their points come from Greg Zerline's foot. And look, there's a reason why this dude was a seventh round rookie draft pick and why he wasn't going to supposedly wasn't supposed to see the season or the field all season long. Ben DiNucci, man, he he did not look that great tonight. Well, see, I, 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 I mean, I ain't finna disagree with you. Is but I look at it in a lot of different ways. Like I don't think he looked like it. Didn't look to me like he didn't belong. Like I've seen some other quarterbacks who look like they they just don't belong. Uh, he didn't look like that, but he was a little bit skittish. Um, his accuracy was awful in a lot. God, um, I mean, some of those throws. I can't believe he didn't throw an interception. 
Well, it wasn't from lack of effort. I know. I but, mean, he was trying to get the Eagles a ball. Uh, but, you know, the game was moving fast for him. And um, as you would expect in your first NFL start, man. And so I cut him some slack for that. Uh, again, I don't look at this game and say he was the sole reason why they lost. Um, it was a complete uh, – I mean, you know, he just they got to get more help from him, but I don't know they could because the help that you need really comes from the offensive line, and that is what it is at this particular time. It ain't getting no better. And, uh, you know, man, the, all I know is this. I had a couple people on Twitter say something, and I was like, what, what are you talking about? What's your point? Because uh, somebody was like, well, he's doing the same thing Dak did. We didn't get to the playoffs with Dak. We ain't getting to the playoffs with these guys. What? I'm like, you are drunk. Bro. What are you talking about? Like, the Cowboys have one touchdown, I believe, in 31 possessions in the three games Dak hasn't started. We're talking about a team that was breaking all kind of offensive records with Dak in there with the same raggedy Rudy Poot offensive line for the most part because he could get to the ball, to the receivers. He knew the nuance of the offense. Yeah. He could escape trouble, all those things. Now you're seeing the difference between a guy. And remember, Dak is really good. He's not even elite. <laughs> so you're seeing the difference <laughs> between an upper echelon NFL quarterback and guys who aren't. And it's stunning, or it should be stunning to y'all who didn't recognize the difference. Now, me, your boy, I've been doing this for 25 years. I know the difference. I've seen the difference. I didn't have to be convinced. Some of y'all had to be convinced. Well, y'all ought to be convinced by now. I hope so, after what we saw tonight. And, you know, they tried to help him out. It was a really weird play-calling game, I felt like. We, uh -huh. we had talked about this, you know, at points leading into this game that the idea because of the pressure that Philadelphia is able to get when they rush just four and you figured Schwartz might blitz a little bit more because you're talking about a rookie quarterback making his first NFL career start. But it, they were making obvious efforts, especially in the first half, to get the ball out of his hand as quickly as possible. As a matter of fact, he only had two completions past the line of, of scrimmage in the first half on his passes. He was 2 of 11 on passes beyond the line of scrimmage in the first half. And it, but it was because they were doing a lot of screens. They were doing a lot of those, okay, turn around and, and fire it out to Michael Gallup, who's standing with you behind the line of scrimmage and see if we can get a few yards. Yeah, um, for the most part, the game plan didn't bother me. You know, they tried the Wildcat. They had a reverse. They had a double reverse. They had a fake reverse. Man, they tried like hell to get Cedric Wilson to throw the I ball. mean, my God, they wanted to bust that out. Um, uh, it's like, we so, get it. But, he used to be a quarterback. Neat. You know, Move but on. I told you uh, <laughs> earlier that I would much rather see that approach than let's run Zeke between the tackles 45 times because we're scared to do anything. Right. That, and see, I appreciated that. They were trying to win the game. Um, now, they didn't work, and that's okay, but I appreciated the effort. Um, because you're compromised right now. This isn't what anybody signed up for in terms of offense with the injuries. And so you got to make the best you can do with it. And the best they could do with it was try some trick plays and hope, hope some of them worked. I think if you go back and look at it, the game was lost when you had, I think they had two possessions on the other side of the 50 and they came away with Three right. points. Yeah, I mean, you're talking about a team that had been hoping all season to get some drives in opposition territory. You have four takeaways in this game. To your point, they started one on the 25-yard line, on Philly's 25-yard right. line, and they're only able to get a field goal out of that. The other one they started on the Philly 46-yard line and were unable to come away with anything out of that. And, and that's tough, man. I mean, rookie quarterback or not, when, when your defense finally shows up and makes some plays for you and is getting some stops and get, and takes the ball away from Philadelphia four times and you've got nine points to show from that because the offense is just so damn bad right now. I mean, they are. I mean, I, I ain't surprised. It's what I expected. And, um, you know, it's – it's. let me tell you something, brother. It ain't getting no better no time soon. No, it's I not. Mean, it's I'm, not. I'm being honest. How many points do you think they're going to score against Pittsburgh next week? I wouldn't be surprised if they score zero. I'm serious. So am I. 
I don't think they'll score a touchdown. If you can't score a touchdown against Philadelphia, and in three games with Dak, we're, we're seeing you struggle to move the ball down the field whatsoever, and you're basically just hoping you can get in field goal position so that you can attempt some of these long field I mean, that 59-yarder Zerline hit, I couldn't. I don't think he could believe he made it. <laughs> you know, but that's what that. this team has become. You're hoping, can we at least do something so that Greg Zerline can run out here and just kick a 52 or a 59-yard field goal for us? Well, the problem is with the offensive line, um, it's not the blocking is not consistent enough to move the ball consistently, right. and that's the problem. So you're trying to get big plays. I think the uh, the longest play tonight was 15 yards. Man, you can't win like that. No, it, the it, NFL it, is about big plays because right. big plays lead to points. Without big plays, what do you have to do? You got to drive the ball 10 plays, 80 yards. Your line is not good enough to do that because you're going to have a tackle for mm-hmm. loss. You're going to mm-hmm. have a hold. You're going to have a, an incompletion. I mean, go back. And I had it written down at a certain point about midway through the game. You know, they, I think they were two for 12 on third downs. Well, go back and see why. Third and 13, third and 17, third yep. and eight, third and 10, third and 12. I mean, dude, Dak Prescott would struggle to do that. Anybody would. And they kept putting themselves in those situations, whether it was sacks, whether it was the, the weird ass plays that didn't work. Like, And like I mentioned earlier, I get it. It's cool that you're trying some of these plays that you're doing. But at some point, it's like, OK, we get it. It, 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 and sure enough, Philadelphia snuffs it out. And the next thing you know is, you know, instead of maybe a, a, a second and nine, it's a second and 16 and things are just going backwards. And, you know, you look at it tonight on the ground, Zeke had 19 carries, only 63 yards as a team. They had 35 carries for 133 yards. The receivers can't get down the field because pressure comes so quickly against these guys. They don't have time. I thought it was interesting how involved Michael Gallup was today because he kind of filled the role that we're used to Amari Cooper filling, which is just kind of standing out there catching short passes. But they don't have any ability to have anybody go deep because they don't have time in the pocket to allow that play to develop down the field. And that, I mean, we talked about it earlier uh, to uh, Sunday afternoon when we were on the ticket. Yeah. Which is when you can't throw, when you can't complete passes deep, they start creeping up and sooner or later they take away the short stuff because they're not mm-hmm. worried about the deep stuff. That's, I mean, so he took a couple shots deep later in the game and that was great, but you just have to take them even if you're throwing them up because if you don't, they just slowly, slowly, slowly choke the life out of your offense. Yeah, and then it becomes this whole thing where you're hoping to hit a bunch of, of quick short passes like we saw, hoping that somehow one of those dudes like a C.D. Lamb or Gallup or Cooper or somebody can actually get you some yak and, and break a couple of tackles and, and stretch the field because that's the only thing this offense can do. Ten points against Arizona, three points last week against Washington, nine points this week. That means they haven't scored a touchdown in their last two games. They have four field goals of offense to show you. In 31, uh, I think it's been 20 possessions in the last two games. But that's what you're going to get, bro. That's what it is. When you can't move the ball and see, again, I, I mean, I've been trying to tell folks, it's not about what you think the opposition can do against the Cowboys defense because Cowboys defense hadn't been good this year. They were they were really good today. Yeah. But it doesn't matter. None of that matters. The only thing that matters is because you got to score points to win. What can your offense do? And right now, it's crazy because three weeks ago, mm-hmm. they were one of the best offenses in the league. And we were like, if you'll just stop turning it over, you will be prolific like very few we've seen. And now three weeks later, what I tell you, man, sports is fluid, baby. It'll change quick on you. Um, now they're one of the worst offenses in the league, man. They can't do anything. Well, and you can go through the whole thing. I mean, what are you supposed to do? It's one thing, and we it's, it's almost like the reverse of what we talk about with these young quarterbacks. The Cowboys have done a really good job getting all these weapons. Well, if you don't have somebody that can consistently give the weapons the ball, it doesn't matter if you have weapons or not, and that's what we're seeing. No, that's what we talked about, is that the weapons are great. Matters not – you know, I mean, dude. I mean, it's like it's like we say all the time about different stuff. Okay, fine. You got a Ferrari. It's sitting in your garage. It's beautiful. I love the rims. I love the interior. Your <laughs> engine ain't worth a poop. You right? cut the head. It doesn't run. Yeah, man. Okay, it, big deal. It ain't no good. Yeah, I mean, this it it was. 
And it's weird, too, because you you have kind of flipped the script to where now the, every time the Cowboys get the ball, that's why I was thinking, I was like, surely they'll score that they start out at the, at the Eagles 25. That's like overtime in college football. You know, and, and they end up getting a field goal. But it's, it's it, this is a bad team all the way across the board. And now the fact that the offense is this putrid. And like you said, I mean, I don't think it's a stretch to truly believe that they do not score against Pittsburgh next week. Well, see, you know, the problem is um, against Washington, they faced a very good defensive line. Against Philadelphia, they faced a very good defensive line. Against Pittsburgh, they're going to face a very complete defense uh, at all three levels. And that's why it's Mm. going to be hard to score. And, uh, you know, I had a couple of people think I was taking shots at them. Because I I picked the score 31 to 6. And again, it's I don't know how you can score. Yeah, you were right, because I, I said 27 to 10, because I thought surely they can get a touchdown this week. I was wrong. I mean, two well, full see, games without a touchdown. Well, see, it comes to that thing where you go, surely they'll score, and to me, that falls along that same line of, and you've heard this before. Some of you have, some of you haven't. You know, you flip a coin 100 times, and it comes up right. tails every time. You go, well, surely the next one's got to be head. <laughs> you got to play the probabilities. Right. No, it's still you know. 50-50. It hasn't changed. <laughs> and so you can say, well, surely they'll score. But the reality is no, because nothing's changed. Yeah. Every position, every possession starts with that same makeshift, no good right now, offensive line that can't do anything consistently. So that's what everything starts with. And without the big plays, dude, it's just a it's hard, man. It is hard without the big plays. It's a grind. It is. Nine points tonight on three field goals. 23 to nine. Cowboys are two and six in a lost season, obviously, as you just sit here and wait for the next eight weeks. So we continue here on this version of the podcast, recording late into the night after the Sunday night football loss. You know, it's funny. We were just talking about the offense, and I saw this pop up that I thought was interesting before we move on to the defense where the Dallas Cowboys were averaging 7.7 yards per pass play with Dak Prescott as the quarterback, tied for the third best in the NFL. Since he was injured, they've averaged just 3.4 yards per pass play, the lowest across the league. (laughs) I don't even have the words to say how bad it is. Um, Now, some of it is because the last two weeks, they faced good defensive lines. Right. And they don't have a good offensive line. So it's been a bad matchup for them. Problem is, it ain't going to get no better next week against Pittsburgh because it's the same thing. Uh, Except they bring pressure, you know, a little bit with their linebackers in addition to their defensive line. So you have to figure out a way to deal with it. But, you know, I mean, uh, you look at these next few games coming up. You've got Pittsburgh, then the bye, then you have Minnesota, then Washington again, then Baltimore. (laughs) So... I mean, well, those... see, you know, dude, like, see, that's a problem because, like, even, like, Minnesota, you can look at their record, even though they beat Green Bay today. Mm-hmm. What is Mike Zimmer? He's a defensive, a defensive guy. expert. Yeah. Yep. And so whatever flaws you have, he going to pick them up and exploit them. And then, you know, then, then you go back to Washington where it's a bad matchup. And then you're with the Ravens. Well, just good luck, man. Because yeah. Because – the problem with the Ravens game is they won't throw the ball. I mean, if you can't stop their running game, they'll run it for 350 yards. Yeah, they'll run all over Dallas. But I, I, yeah, I will say, so. you know, and, and that's one of the things when we look at this tonight, they allowed pressure on 30% of the snaps that uh, Danucci dropped back on. The run game, as we kind of already mentioned, was was just really nothingness for the most part. I mean, they were running at 3.8 yards per carry and just did not do enough offensively. Now, the flip side of this, of course, as we get into this, this is, I mean, this might be the best defensive performance the Cowboys have had all year. I mean, maybe week one against L.A.? No, it's, uh, I don't think there's any doubt it's the best defensive performance. I mean, they had four turnovers. They had, th- th- what was it, three in the first six games. Uh, they had a couple sacks uh, that led to turnovers. They gave the ball to the offense in position to score. Uh, they held uh, Carson Wentz to like 125 yards passing. Mm-hmm. They held the uh, the team to, I think, 220, 230 yards. Yep. It was by far, easily, their best, most complete defensive performance of the year. 
um, that you'd have to grade them and give them an A. There's nothing bad you could say about their pass defense. Uh, their run defense uh, was a little shady, and if uh, Philadelphia had, had more patience and continued to grind on it, I don't know that they wouldn't have put up 200 yards rushing. But like a lot of offensive coordinators, Doug Peterson just got restless and continued to throw the ball. Um, so, no, nah, man, it was, a, it was a step in the right direction. But, I mean, this is a bad offensive team. Philadelphia's a bad team. So, yeah. you get credit for what you did, but I'm not going to start walking down this whole, oh, they've turned the corner. This is the first start of something special. This defense now understands everything Mike Nolan wants them to do. That's too much for your boy. No, and I agree with you. You know, they, they did get some pressure. Obviously, they had the four sacks. I thought Tank had a fantastic game today. I mean, I, he was he showed up like the type of guy like we've talked about before. If you're a leader on this defense in a week in which Everson Griffin is traded and Worley and Poe are cut from the team, I thought Demarcus Lawrence really showed up tonight. He's always out there. You always see the effort, but he was making plays tonight and seemed to have an extra gear or took his game to a different level at some point tonight. No, he was very active tonight. I, I knew early on he was active. And so, um, you know, that's what they need more of. They need him. I mean, when you're, when you're compromised the way they're compromised, man, your best players got to be your best players. I mean, your best players can't be, you know, low on the totem pole in terms of production. Your best players got to be your best players. And if they're not, then you just gonna it's going to be ugly and it's going to be bad and it's going to be sad. But uh, Demarcus Lawrence was good today. Six tackles, uh, a sack, three tackles for loss, and two hits on a quarterback. You can't ask a man to do a whole lot more than that. Yeah, and a couple of those guys, you know, like Randy Gregory at times, I mean, he showed – I thought the, the – I didn't like the roughing the passer penalty. I get that you're going to call it, but that was like at his waist, not at his knees. I didn't think it was a low enough hit that it should have been called a penalty. And that was on a third down that ended up giving him a first down with that 15-yard penalty. But, you know, Randy Gregory had some nice plays tonight. Obviously, I thought Leighton Van Der Esch, it felt more like Leighton is starting to get back into the rhythm of playing in football games again. He was very active tonight and had some nice plays. You know, it's funny because I'm looking at the stats. He only had two tackles. That's very low for him. Yeah. He's usually uh, much higher than that. But he exploded on that sack that led to a fumble. Dude, he, he, I thought uh, he killed Carson Wentz. It's like, oh, God, that was awesome. No, nah, that was a, a spectacular hit. And it was a form tackle, too. I mean, it was beautiful. Yeah. Uh, so the defense played, played well, man. Um, they did as much as you can do in a single game. They've got some stuff that they can build on. Uh, but now we'll see because Pittsburgh's a different kind of beast. Um, Carson Wentz was awful, man. You know, I don't know what his deal is. Uh, he's regressed, and uh, he threw some balls up. He made some poor decisions. and um, But, you know, you get credit for whether you beat a good team or a bad team. If you destroy them, then you get credit for it, man. It's much like we were talking about uh, earlier, uh, you know, with Pat Mahomes. Yeah, the Jets stink, but hell, he threw for 450 yards and five touchdowns. So, you know, he did what he should have done. You got to play the team on the field, man. I mean, that, right. that's just what it is. And, and, you know, Trayvon Diggs tonight, obviously, it was weird because he got beat a couple of times, but he also had the phenomenal interceptions. I mean, both those picks, you kind of see the former receiver in him. That one that he caught right at the goal line, I mean, he tracked that ball. It was like he was the intended receiver on that. I mean, that was a fantastic interception. And then the other one, and I think you'll hear a little bit of this on Secret Audio of a Cowboys Homer uh, that we'll play here later on in the podcast. But, man, that pick in the corner of the end zone, and they kept looking. I was like, what are you guys talking about? You realize that the part of his leg that touched is his shin. He's down in the end zone. It's a touchback, obviously. Well, here's the thing about Trayvon Diggs. He gave up that big completion early that led to a touchdown. All right. Um, and the thing about him was, it's okay, man. It's the NFL. You're going to get beat, and you're going to give up some plays. It's the NFL. They all do it, man. It happens to everybody. The problem was he wasn't making enough plays. Like, they keep attacking you. They keep making plays. Go get some. And I realize this is 30 years old, okay? I realize this. I'm reminded of Everson Walls' rookie year in the NFL where he had 11, where he had 13 interceptions. Right. Now, nobody thinks anybody's going to get 13 interceptions today. If you go back and study it, Everson Wallace probably gave up 20 touchdowns that year. You know what I mean? Yeah. But 
He made some plays like, okay, you made some plays on me? I'm going to go make some plays on you. And it's a yin-yang thing. And you can live with that. And Trayvon Diggs tonight, man, seven tackles, four pass deflections. How about that? The two interceptions. That was a heck of a game. It's a game he can build on. And now, you know, if you if you, I think that's the kind of th- game that gives you confidence, man. Yeah. In terms of finally, I got my hands on the football. Now I, I made some plays. Yeah, I can call him. My brother Stefan won't be harassing me because he's scoring <laughs> touchdowns and I ain't got no interceptions. And his team's in first place and my team's not going anywhere. So now, yeah, I can finally pick up the phone and chat and say, yeah, I have arrived. And now, can you build on that? I mean, two in one game. You, you guys listening realize that he has now matched the season high for any Cowboys defender in each of the past two seasons. Their their leading interceptions were with two interceptions each. So he now has done that in one game. So good for him. Wow. <laughs> I know so, when you think about it, it's wild like that. But yeah, I, I thought you know for the most part. The defense made some nice plays, and Carson Wentz kind of did what he does and allowed them a couple of times because, you know, we talked about this on our last podcast last week about one of the things Carson Wentz does, he will turn the ball over. He fumbles a ton. He fumbles more than any other quarterback in the NFL because he holds on to the ball too long and he does dumb things. And we saw a lot of that tonight from him. And sure enough, I mean, Carson Wentz by himself gave the Cowboys four turnovers. That's hard to do, bro. <laughs> That is hard to do. But the first one was a joke. He's out there by himself. And I I like the play, though, that Donovan Wilson made because he saw him out there and he just – it's like he hit a turbo button and all of a sudden he was on him. And then he attacked the free hand where the ball was. Okay, that's what you should do. I mean, it was a dumb play by Carson Wentz. Either throw the ball out of bounds, tuck the ball, do whatever, but protect the ball. Uh, the Leighton Van Der Esch sack, man, you're supposed to fumble on that. He just blasted you. Uh, but, you know, the interception in the back of the end zone, it was a great play by Diggs, but it was a bad throw by Carson because it wasn't close to the receiver. I know. I, not to mention the fact, and, and I'd be curious on the coach's film to see what he was looking at, but there were two Cowboys defenders on the receiver he was throwing towards as he was running across his body like 40 yards down the field or whatever it was. And then on the uh, over-the-shoulder catch again, Chris Collinsworth on the net, on the broadcast was trying to say, well, maybe the wind took it and blew it, and maybe it did. No, it didn't. It was a horrible throw. He overthrew him. But even him. that one was, you know, was overthrown by two or three yards. On the inside, instead of on the, uh, you know, on the outside, instead of on the inside, where he could run into it. So, you know, it's a bad game by Carson Wentz, and um, the Cowboys defense gets credit for what they did. But it does make you wonder, man. You know, just how much rope, um, I don't like that analogy, just how much room for error uh, Carson Wentz has. I mean, yeah, they're they're in first place, but it's the skinniest fat guy. This division stinks. They got Jalen Hurts back there. Is he a viable option? I don't know. I don't know either, man. And, and, you know, and they brought him in a little bit in this game, and and he does, you know, the wildcat thing. And, and, you know, there was a whole, oh, they'll use him like the Saints use Taysom Hill. And we used to, I argued the crap out of this when they drafted him back in April. It's like you don't spend that that type of draft capital, a second-round pick on a player that's going to be on the field. What do you get tonight, like three snaps? Yeah, that's just That's just, it's it's dumb. And, and, you know, that you can't walk away from Wentz. I don't know what they do, but the Carson Wentz problem that all of a sudden Philadelphia seems to have this season is really strange. You know, the question, the anonymous quotes, they kind of talked about that at the beginning of the broadcast. But now you're talking about a quarterback who out of the blue, and as I mentioned, he has fumbled since he's been in the league. He has fumbled more than any quarterback in the league. But he wasn't a guy that gave you a ton of interceptions. And now all of a sudden this year, I mean, what are we? They're eight games into the season. He's thrown 12 interceptions in eight games. That ain't no good, bro. That's horrible. You can't be doing that where you're you're good for a, a minimum of an interception a game. <laughs> no, no. But, you know, they committed to him because of the money. So uh, the only thing they can do is probably coach him up and, and hope he improves. Yeah, I don't know what what the deal is. It's a really weird thing. 
you know, and you see some of that too, because like you pointed out on a couple of those throws, I mean, you're talking about a guy in his fifth year in the NFL. You're not talking about a first or a second year player. And to consistently see that those are some of the problems again, especially on the one where Donovan Wilson got him and he fumbled, like you're a fifth year quarterback doing that. No, that's an awful play, man. If I was a Philly yeah. fan, I'd be pissed about Carson Wentz right now. Uh, Yeah. There's, there's no doubt about that, but maybe maybe the Cowboys' defense made him look bad. <laughs> maybe they finally did what we've been Come asking on, them dude. to do. Mike Nolan's defense really confused him, and that is why um, he had all the turnovers. Okay. I like to think anyway. All right, yeah, you know what? Sure, let's go with that one. But, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, the Eagles are on the hook. There's no way you can walk away from this guy in 2021 or 2022. I mean, you, you're still eating $15 million in dead cap if you kind of walk away from the last two years of his deal. But I, I don't know. Who knows? It's a really weird conundrum that they have. And for a guy who still is unproven in the playoffs. I mean, he's just like last year when they made the playoffs. And they they ended up going and Carson Wentz gets hurt early on in that playoff game and barely played. It's Cowboys defense. They did a good job today against Carson Wentz. But he's playing so bad that they got Ben Roethlisberger next week. Let's see what they do against him because he's a different kind of beast. He's not what he was, but he's still good. And so let's see if they can uh, – They can harass Big Ben into a few turnovers, a few mistakes next week. Then I might be willing to concede that they're they're getting better. Yeah, because you you look at Pittsburgh next week in this defense with Big Ben and the weapons that that dude has at his disposal, and and you know they don't have James Conner. I think is is okay at running back, but he's still running at four point seven yards a clip, you know. And then you you look at his receivers. And Juju Smith is obviously there and has been solid for him, but he has found this Chase Claypool guy the last couple of weeks. Claypool had another yeah, big bro. game for him the day. You look at Juju Smith, as I mentioned, Deontay Johnson. They have Eric Ebron at tight end. They've got a variety of weapons that are fast that he can use to spread the ball around, and that's going to be a really interesting challenge for this defense next week. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Um, they're going to have a tough time with it. Which is why I'm gonna I'm gonna praise him today before I I start talking about what they can't do next week. Yeah, and you you know you look at it and and all right, fair enough. Praise them for losing twenty three to nine, I guess. Which yeah, which man. you know it's interesting because we talked about this last week. We had multiple conversations, and it's going to be one of those things that everybody's curious about as the season progresses. After today's games. Dallas is now in sixth worst position in the NFL. So there are still five teams that are worse position-wise, okay. record-wise, than the Cowboys are right now. Who are those five teams? Well, you know one of them for sure because one of them Jets. is – Right. Okay, they will still be worse than Dallas at the end of the year. And then you have three one-loss team, or excuse me, three one-win teams – the Giants, the Jags, and the Texans are all one and six. The Giants, the Jags, and the Texans. The Texans will win. They'll finish with more wins than the Cowboys. Uh, the Giants, uh, they got a tough deal. But I can see the Giants winning uh, three to four games. All right. Maybe. I mean, maybe. they do get to play the Cowboys again, so maybe that'll be one of their That's wins. What I'm saying. And they get Washington. And Washington, while Washington is a bad matchup for Dallas, I don't know that they're the same type of bad matchup for the Giants. See, and then you have the Falcons, who are also 2-6, and six, but technically okay. they have the, the tiebreaker. The Falcons will win more games than the Cowboys. I hope so. So, I mean, you I look mean, I'm at saying this. that because the Falcons have blown a lot of double-digit wins. Falcons are a better team. Right. They just figure out ways to lose. So they'll win more games than the Cowboys. Now, I will say, like, once you take into account today, the Dallas Cowboys now in point differential are second to last in the NFL. They have been outscored by 81 points this year. Only the Jets are worse. The Jets have been outscored by 144 points. Wow. I'm telling you, man, the Uh, the Cowboys to me look like – uh, and I'm, I'm not I'm not throwing shade. I'm just keeping it real with you. Yeah, uh, they look like the uh, the team that's going to end up with the third or fourth pick in the draft to me. 
Yeah, I can see that. They're on pace for that. So two and six, as we mentioned, Pittsburgh next week and then the bye. And I think, I mean, Pittsburgh's undefeated. Pittsburgh's 7-0 and and had a a gutsy, tough win against Baltimore today. And I think every expectation is they come in here and make it 8-0. And And see, when you said that schedule, man, see, the thing you also have to understand with some of these teams, as I've told y'all, as the season goes, they get excited about next year because they're making small incremental steps of progress. Well, the Cowboys had a bunch of expectations. They're not going to get better as the season goes on. Right. What's more likely to happen because they have a roster full of high price alleged stars, what's more likely to happen? What's more likely to happen is if they go through this stretch, man, they've lost three in a row, and then they get beat down by the Steelers, uh, maybe they – I mean, Washington beat them down. I don't know why it's going to be any different the next time around. And then uh, you get beat down uh, with Minnesota and the, and the Ravens. I mean, yeah. you can just – you you could get so beat down from the from the losses that you just kind of mail it in and say, you know what, 2021 is our year. We'll, see, we'll regroup and get, get it next year. Yeah, I, I can easily see that happening, man. The way that this thing is laying out and, and – I mean, I, look, I'm sure there's some guys on the team that believe they can beat Pittsburgh, but let's be honest. Pittsburgh's going to whip their ass. They're going to be 2-7 and seven going into the bye. And then when that happens, you got a whole week off where you're going trying to get your mind away from what will then be a four-game losing streak in a complete trash waste of a season at 2-7. and seven. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, it is what it is. It really it? is, man. It really yeah, is. There's no way to shook it, There's no way to make you feel better. Defense played good today, 220 yards, allowed four turnovers, and it wasn't close to being enough. No. I mean, dude, the number of teams that win when they commit four turnovers has got to be like less than 5%. It's incredible. It's incredible to think that you went out, you won the turnover battle, you were plus two in the turnover margin, and you lost the game by double-digit points. How many is that, 14? Yeah, 14. Yeah, 14, because that's what they were doing when they went for that weird thing at the end of the game where they they snapped the ball out of the end zone to get the safety so they could free kick it, which almost turned out. I was like, all right, okay, Bones Fossil, I see you. I guess that's that's why they brought you in. Now, it didn't work, but it was cool. It set up, right? Dude, all I can think of now is seven consecutive games where they've been down by at least 14. Yeah, it's pretty impressive. I mean, it, it's that is so hard to do. Dude, we all watch the game tonight. Everybody listening to this, whenever you're listening to it, whether you're waking up on Monday morning and catching it early or sometime in the middle of the week and you're catching up, whatever it is, you watch the game and we all thought the same thing. These are two shit football teams and we are watching a display of what's worse, diarrhea or the constipated kind. I mean, it, it, that's what? what we were watching. Take your pick. This was a really bad game. This was one of those games, honestly, where you're watching, and if if you're not a fan of one of the teams and you don't have to work and cover these teams, I, I wonder how many people turn this thing off in the third, fourth quarter because it was an uh, ugly-ass game. Yeah, you know, maybe so. That's a little bit of a hypothetical for me, but, uh, yeah, I get you. No, I think probably a lot of people did, but who knows? It, it's just it, it's a bad team. It, it, it was an ugly loss against an ugly team. Because the Eagles are not good. I mean, you watch that Eagles team and you sit no, there. The Eagles aren't good. It, it, and I'm like, my God, the Eagles are bad. And that just goes to show you how bad the Cowboys are that the Eagles beat them by two touchdowns. All right, before we move on, need to remind you again of one of our sponsors. And we've been signing up a few more sponsors, and that's pretty awesome. It's really great to have some of the new ones on board. As we mentioned earlier, the Blue Star Auto Group and Freeway Tire Shop. But, of course, the wings from Kroger, man, I keep telling you guys about them. It's funny, too, because every weekend I'll get a few tweets of people that have gone out and tried them. Like, dude, these are really good. I know. I'm telling you, they're really good. The mango habanero is my favorite. They also have buffalo blue cheese. They're available at Kroger stores across North Texas. So all you got to do is walk in, you go back to the meat counter, and you tell the dude who cuts up all the meat and stuff, I want those wings Throw me out a couple of pounds, and they'll wrap them up and take care of you. They aren't breaded like most of the other ones that you get. So all you get with the wings that are sold at Kroger, the meat, the flavor. So check those out, and we appreciate that support because they're legit really good. Very good. No, they're very tasty. I threw mine in the air fryer. 
you know, so it gave him that little crispy feel. So that was all good. Yeah, I bet that was good. I put mine on the grill, but you know, I'm a big I'm a big fan of the grill. I don't have an air fryer, but that might be something I've heard it can work wonders. Uh, you should invest in an air fryer. They don't cost that much these days. It's it's a good deal. All right. Well, maybe I will do that then. All right. We have an air fryer conversation on another day. <laughs> not a, not on the night after what we just witnessed with the Cowboys. Right. So we will continue, and, you know, I kind of wanted to get into a little bit of the play calling here because it it was a really interesting look at Kellen Moore, the adaptability, which we kind of talked about in regards to Ben DiNucci and understanding that Philadelphia is going to be able to get a lot of pressure, that we've got a dude who's probably not going to have a lot of time in the pocket. And they, they try to do some interesting things and design some things to help the offense out a little bit. I mean, they were joking about it on the broadcast, but it did seem like at some point that they were just in the room this week and said, hey, man, what plays you ever wanted to call in an NFL game you never thought you would? (laughs) Um, I like the game plan in general. I thought it was fine. Because, again, man, you're not good enough to drive the field on anybody, really. The only way to score points is to make some big plays. And the best way to make big plays is you can't protect your quarterback is to try a little trickery and see if that works. Uh, and so the game plan, I, it didn't bother me at all, man. They, kinda, they came out with the reverse to CeeDee Lamb, I think, early in the game. Uh, they had the Wildcat, the Zeke working. That was fine. Um, you know, they fell in love. Now, I got to tell you, they fell in love with the uh, wide, uh, wide receiver pass to Cedric Wilson. Man, no doubt. They, they wanted they that bad. Like three times. Yeah. Um, but uh, I get what they were trying to do, man. Uh, it's a sign. It's a sign of desperation, too. <laughs> you know, it's a sign that you're not good enough to win straight up, and so you got to do all this other stuff. And that, to me, is okay because you're trying to win. To me, this just me now. Worst thing of all would have been to try to run the ball 35 times with Zeke between the tackles, man. right? Yeah, I, I liked the the one probably that I liked the most was the fake on the double reverse that I think it was to Pollard who ended up going for like 14 yards on that one where I, I thought that was cool because I think it faked out the camera, as I recall. And I thought, I was like, what? what you, oh, I was like, oh, that's awesome. So it was neat, you know, tons of reverses, tons of motion and some trick plays and things like that. But it, it did get interesting late in the game when they had an opportunity to maybe make this a game and and get the lead back when it was, I think it was 15 to nine at the time. Well, it's 15 to nine, man. And it's, it's right after uh, Diggs gets the interception. Right, right. That's right. Yeah. And he returns it 30. I mean, he makes this, this terrific over the shoulder interception and then he returns it uh, to the Dallas 31. And then we start, I'm like, Oh snap. Zeke for nine, Zeke for six. Zeke for eight. Oh, snap. What, what's going on here? I haven't seen this before. Tony Pollard is seven and for seven. And they're running behind Zach Martin. He's moving people. Tony Pollard for two. Tony Pollard for nine. First down. Elliott for two. Man, eight straight runs. They've moved from their 31 to the Philly 28. Wow. Let's pound Zeke in there again, man. Take their heart. Run them over. No, here comes the reverse pass to Cedric Wilson. They want him to throw the ball. Well, Fletcher Cox has only seen that play like three times. <laughs> He's like, oh, okay, so y'all That's ain't blocking true. me. Let me see what trick play y'all run. Oh, this is little skinny dude running. Let me go tackle him. Ten-yard loss, man, which means now instead of uh, some kind of manageable third down, it's third and 18. You know, there's a little pass out in the flat to CeeDee Lamb for two yards, and then Zerline attempts a 52-yard field goal. You miss it, and I ain't mad at him for missing a 52-yard field goal. He made three of them. Right, and it was windy. Uh, I mean, it was crazy windy out there tonight. And so you give up the ball without scoring, and then, of course, they then drive the ball nine plays, 58 yards, and go up 15-9. So instead of the Cowboys having a chance to go up, you know, 12 or, you know, because uh, the score was nine to uh, nine, to, nine seven. to seven. Yeah, that's right. Instead of going up twelve to seven, or in a in a great situation, you know, sixteen to seven, and really putting some pressure on Philly, you get nothing. They come right down and take the lead. And to me, that was um, that was probably Kellen Moore's worst play call of the year. 
Yeah, I, th- I thought that was interesting. I also thought it was interesting on the next drive when they're down 15-9, to nine, and both times you had opportunities on fourth down where you could have ran the ball, maybe with Zeke. It felt like the Cowboys were getting at least a couple of yards. The fourth and inches call, you want to go Danucci there. Uh, cool. Somehow they decided he moved the ball three inches, which was yeah, enough to brother. get the first down. But the fourth and two call, I did not like that at all. I mean, it, And again, to me... Zeke Elliott, get him on the field, find a better call, find a way on fourth and two rather than a Ben DiNucci incomplete pass trying to target a guy that only had one catch today in Amari Cooper. But both yeah, those I two think, series I thought were a little strange for Kellen. Um, I think it's hard to I think it's hard to run for two yards on fourth down. Um, with your offensive line, it ain't no good. Um, now, I wouldn't mind a read option there or something. Yeah, I mean, if you want to run it, something that gives you – a little bit more of an option. Uh, I didn't really like the pass per se, but I don't know if I didn't like it because it didn't work or if I didn't like that route combination. Um, so, you know, man, when your offense is this bad, you don't have a lot of margin for error. And uh, this is what happens when you make them, you know, when it's not all perfect for you. Yeah, it, it was – I don't know. I don't even know how to describe the offense anymore because it was so trash. Yeah, trash. But like tonight with all the trick plays and all the different things that they were trying to do, it almost felt like how in Madden sometimes, I don't know if you ever do this on Madden, but I'll get a play. There used to be a play. I don't think it's in the playbook now that the Cowboys have on this version of Madden that I have, but there used to be one that was like that where I could choose on the end around to give it to the dude and throw a pass with them. And I used to think it was so cool. I used, I would call it all the time, but I could never get it to work. But I was like, man, if I can get this to work one time, that dude's going to be wide open. It'll be easy touchdown. And I was so convinced that at some point it's going to work. So I would, I would keep calling it over and over. And it felt that way to me tonight with they, – they really wanted Cedric Wilson to get the ball on a reverse and throw a touchdown pass to somebody. I think it's a. Uh, I think something like that is a situation where, you know, you you just it's um, you just fall in love with the play. Uh, you liked it or it right, was really yeah. well executed in practice. You know, nobody knows Cedric Wilson was a high school quarterback. Well, I mean, we all know now, but you know, in the element of surprise, I mean, I think it's all working for him. Uh, they just couldn't execute. I always think that's interesting, too, and they go, well, we, you know, we've got a guy who is a high school quarterback, so we feel real confident in him. I was like, what? Okay, cool. I can throw a football as well. I mean, do you want to run a trick play for me? You know, I, I just, I don't know. Just, I get it trying to be creative, trying to do some different things tonight with the quarterback who at times, I, I, I see, and I don't know what to think about Ben DiNucci either. I think it's funny that everybody was calling him Gucci DiNucci, and all this type of thing. And I was like, Gucci, maybe knock off Gucci. But man, fake Gucci. Yeah, fake Gucci. I mean, this dude, I thought some of his passes floated a little bit. He tried really hard to turn the ball over a couple of times with interceptions and it didn't happen. So he, he gave him some fumbles instead. But it's like, what do you expect? This was a guy who wasn't supposed to see the field this year. He's a seventh round draft pick. Obviously, things are going to be moving fast for him. He was going to hold on to the ball too long. He was going to make mistakes. And we saw that happen. So, you know, I, I think it gets to a point because your other options, Garrett Gilbert. No. That's who they got right now. And, you know, Cooper Rush, maybe. I think he's on the practice squad, but that's what they're working with. Now, hopefully Andy Dalton can come back next week, although after seeing the type of pressure of the last couple of weeks that these teams have gotten, I don't know if I'm Andy Dalton, if I want to go out there against Pittsburgh or not. (laughs) I think it's a – I mean, I'm not interested in seeing Cooper Rush. Cooper Rush was here for three years. He He was on the street because nobody else was interested in seeing Cooper Rush. Right. Um, you know, Garrett Gilbert, he's just a guy. I'm not interested in seeing him. Um, if you want to play Danucci again, uh, I'm I'm all right with that. He'd probably be better in his second time out than his first time out. But, you know, in Whispers from the Star a few weeks ago, I was telling you about Danucci, and I said that the Cowboys, I was talking to somebody at the Cowboys who said that, hey, he's got a lot of moxie, he's got a lot of confidence, he's got that point guard, kind of attitude and swag to him, but he's got a lot of technical deficiencies in his game that we need to work out. 
Well, I think you saw all of that tonight. Like, I don't think he was scared. You know, like I don't think he was like, "Oh my god." No, I didn't. I didn't get that sensation from him at all. No, but I thought he was kind of hyped, and he was just kind of a little. It was moving fast for him, which ain't no big surprise. Um, so, and I saw a lot of things you could work with, but you know, I also saw why they didn't expect him to play this year. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and, and I don't know. I I, I get it. it but the, the sidearm slinging thing, a couple of times, it's like, dude, just throw the ball away. Like, you're, you're trying to get a little too cute trying to make some of these plays. But you're a 2 and 6 team. What do you expect? Dude, I mean, you know, like I'm saying, that's, that's what you get with him. That's why he's a developmental quarterback. You know? So, I mean, it happens, man. And you hope that, uh, you know, maybe he's good enough to be the backup in a couple of years. Yeah, you hope so, because what I saw tonight, again, but, uh, again, it, I mean, it's... talking it's, about a seven-round quarterback. See, and that's the thing, is, like, what are you supposed to say about it? It's like, okay, you completed some passes, you made some neat sidearm slinging throws, like you thought you were Pat Mahomes or something. Cool. You also probably should have thrown four interceptions, and you fumbled already twice. I, You know, it, it's... What are, what are the expectations of a seventh-round rookie quarterback in his first start with an offensive line like this? To me, none. And that's pretty much what I got. I mean, yeah. They were 0 and those, those players were 0-9 in the NFL. Now they're 0-10. Who's shocked? By the way, I just, I just saw this for those of you that thought, because there still are, I get it, there still are some fans that have hope that somehow this team could turn it around. Since 1990, when they expanded the playoffs, 112 teams have started the season two and six. Of those 112 teams, none of them have ever made the playoffs. <laughs> oh, in case well, you thought, in case you thought, you know, there was still a chance out there. Uh, I think you can officially put this one to bed. I also saw. I can't remember who it was that put up that. Uh, oh, it was Ed, Ed Warder. He said Mike McCarthy at two and six. Only two head coaches with worse starts in their first season as a Dallas head coach, Tom Landry and Jimmy Johnson, who both started 0-8 in their first seasons. Oh, so you're saying there's a chance he could be a good coach. That's what I'm saying. I mean, both those guys won multiple Super Bowls. So just hold on. It's going to be okay. We move forward here on the podcast. Glad to have you guys hanging out with us whenever you happen to be listening to this. Don't forget, you can find us on Twitter at McMatt Radio at JJT underscore journalist. And, of course, on our Instagram at Jam Session Cast on Instagram. I want to give a shout-out to another one of our sponsors, Beer Geeks Shop in downtown Rockwall. They continue to serve just some phenomenal beers, a wonderful selection, over 400 beers from around the world, all available for you in singles. It's my favorite beer store. I know Jacques and I both get out there in Rockwall to buy our beers from Beer Geek Shop. And I'll tell you, very easy to get to. It's right there off the square in downtown Rockwall. It is a local family-owned business, Jason and Deidre. You can swing by. You can say, hey, I heard the guys talking about whatever it is on the show with beer. And they're going to point you in the right direction every time. So if you're over there on that side of town, head on out to Rockwall, swing by Beer Geek Shop, and they can make it happen for you. And keep in mind, all beers available in singles. So if you want to try six or eight or nine or 12 different beers, you can. And I love that about those guys. Knock yourself out doing it. I'm telling you, man. Good stuff out there in Rockwall with Beer Geek Shop. But we wanted to take a look around the NFL. As I mentioned earlier, the Cowboys are now technically the sixth worst record in the NFL because of the tiebreaker with the Atlanta Falcons. But there was some other action, and I think as the season goes by, we're starting to realize pretty much what we kind of figured going into the season, at least with the few teams, is for real. Pittsburgh is the only undefeated team in the NFL at 7-0. and Kansas City just absolutely smoked the Jets today. They're 7-1. and and then Seattle is sitting up there atop the NFC at six and one. And I think when you when you look at it, you kind of say, okay, yeah, figured all those teams would be good. Not a lot of surprises for the most part across the league today, except for I think some of those teams that we thought might be good that that kind of sucked a little bit to start off. 
showed up and, and surprised some people. And one of those, of course, was none other than the Minnesota Vikings who went into Green Bay today and knocked off the Packers who were 5-1. and one. The Packers are now 5-2. and two. Dalvin Cook had 30 carries, 30 for 163 and three touchdowns, and the Packers couldn't stop them, and the Vikings won because they kept the ball on the ground. Dude, sometimes, uh, sometimes you got to go back to the basics, and it works for them. Um, and it, it worked today, but Dalvin Cook had a bunch of, uh, you know, I, I think he had a bunch of big plays because he also mm-hmm. caught like a long pass, I think. Yeah, he had a 50-yard touchdown catch and run, four touchdowns. It's a grown man game, man. It's a lot of fantasy owners like, wow. Yeah. Dalvin Cook did the damn thing today. Uh, but sometimes, man, when you catch a guy like that and he's in that zone, what are you going to do? Dalvin Cook, man, 50-yard catch and run for a touchdown. 37-yard run, 21-yard run for a touchdown, had another run for 17, and another run for 12. Not much you could do that. He also caught another pass for 13. That's a lot of explosive plays, bro, for one dude in one game. Yeah, I mean, he was a beast today. And, you know, that's again, it's one of those things where I don't think anybody with the Vikings thought that they were going to start the season one and five. And it, it, that's one of those teams that you kind of look at. They're probably out of the playoff chase. I don't know what to make of them, but the Cowboys are going to have to run into them here down the road. And, and we'll see in a couple of weeks what that means when those two teams meet. But big win for them today over Green Bay. I can tell you exactly what it means. It means Dalvin Cook is 25 years. <laughs> He's going to have 280 yards. But, man, it, another team that I think the future is bright for but cannot seem to get out of their own way is the Los Angeles Chargers. On the road in Denver today, Denver scores 21 points in the fourth quarter to come from behind to beat them late, 31-30. to 30. But, again, Justin Herbert – you know, solid game. He threw a couple of picks, but he had three touchdowns. And and that's that's one of those picks that people thought, I think, when they drafted him, like, oh, you should have taken Jordan Love. Like, I don't know. Herbert may need some time. I don't know about Herbert because it was Burrow and Tua as the top two guys. And then here's Herbert as the sixth overall pick. And so far in, in the games he's gotten to play in, man, it looks like they have found something in Justin Herbert. You know, the interesting thing is don't forget the narrative. The narrative was – he was from Eugene. He'd never lived more than two blocks from home. Right. Sheltered kid. Can't handle a lot of things. Be careful with him because I don't know what you're going to get. Well, it turns out he's, he looks like a great player. Yeah, and the flip and side. It's just of- another reminder that you got to be careful with these narratives in the draft, man. You do. And, and it's weird, too, because, you know, Drew Locke, Denver's still trying to figure out – it, much like they they did with Paxton Lynch for a while, uh, is he the answer? And it's hard to say. I mean, he looked good when they came back late in this game, but at the same time, he seems to be one of those guys that will have some moments where you think, okay, Geico we makes can, the claims process so easy. I can guy. manage my claim all. But uh, long term, I don't know. I don't know what the answer is with Drew Locke and the Denver Looks Broncos. Like a really good backup to me. But they're three and four. And they're in the conversation. It's more than we can say for our team. <laughs> Which is so crazy, man. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's – when you look around some of the other action, I mean, Seattle was at home and they smoked the 49ers today. And Russell Wilson is still doing his thing. He threw another four touchdown catches today. DK Metcalf, 12 catches, 161, two touchdowns. And now that he's got Lockett and Metcalf – Man, I, Seattle looks like with the way Russell Wilson is playing at this point in his career that they – and they do have the best record, but they legit look like they're the best team in the NFC. Well, what's funny is they got the worst defense. <laughs> I mean, Pete Carroll has always had a good defense. Now, I mean, when Russell won those first Super Bowl, they did it with a defensive-minded team. Now yeah. they're an offensive-minded team. But they can do that because they got two big time receivers. The game has slowed down for them. Chris Carson's a really good running back when he's healthy. Yeah, when he's healthy. Uh, I mean, both their both their him and Carlos Hyde were hurt today and couldn't play. They had to rely on some dude named DJ Dallas. Oh, okay. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I was trying to find you, him in fantasy. <laughs> <laughs> if if you had to go to Seattle in a non COVID experience and deal with the twelfth man, yeah, good luck with all of that. Uh, still tough to win there because they just had so much confidence playing at home. 
But it looks to me like the road to the Super Bowl is going through Seattle, and that's a tough place to go and get a dub, man. Yeah, it feels that way, and it's interesting, like you pointed out, because their their defense isn't any good, and you can score on them. But then when you look around the NFC, I, I don't know who else it would be. The Saints won in overtime today in Chicago, where somehow Chicago, I mean, was an overtime away from Chicago being 6-2. and two. But both the Saints and the Bears, I think they have their flaws – And then you look at a team like the Packers, and of course the Packers who got smoked by Tampa Bay a couple of weeks ago and then lose to the Vikings. Maybe it's the Bucs. Maybe the Bucs are that team, and and they've got the Giants tomorrow night. Well, whenever you're listening to it, they play Monday night football against the Giants. On the road in New York, they should beat the Giants. They'll be 6-2 and if they win. Maybe the Buccaneers are for for real. That's what, uh, you know, the thing about the Bucs is they've been getting Tom Brady weapons. He's been he's been getting time to get acclimated to the offense, and don't forget, man, Todd Bowles is running that defense. Now I'm biased because I think Todd Bowles is a terrific coach. Yeah, uh, who got a bad deal with the Jets, uh, but he's running that defense, man, and they kicking butt, taking names. Uh, that's a team to be wary of. Yeah, they are, and, and right now, as we get to really the midway point, assuming that they win. On Monday night, which I don't know how the Giants are going to beat Tampa, but it, it, it does kind of feel like Seattle. And, and here's the thing about Tampa. Tampa's got a damn good defense. That's what I mean. You know, and, and so that's the thing. Like Tampa's defense is a lot better than Seattle's defense. And Tampa, as you just kind of mentioned, you know, they've got some really nice weapons. Now, they, they, they're they banged up because Mike Evans is not playing at 100%. Chris Godwin's going to have to miss again this week. But then you bring in Antonio Brown, and I don't know if he's playing this week or not, but he'll get into the fold and get things going. And it's going to be interesting to see if the, if the weapons that Tampa has for Tom – if they can get healthy as the season goes and some of these nicks and things maybe work themselves out a little bit for them, that may be a really difficult team to beat in the playoffs with a guy who knows how to win in Tampa. In That's Tampa. the whole thing. He's a guy who knows how to win. Yeah, That's you know, the key. elsewhere around the NFL, from what we saw today, Joe Burrow, I think the, the Cincinnati Bengals definitely have found something there. They knocked off a 5-1 and one Titans team this afternoon, 31-20. to 20. I know the Bengals are only 2-5-1, and one, and they've got a lot of holes that need some help, but you've, it, it looks like they filled the biggest one with Joe Burrow because that dude is legit, and he is ice cold, and he can win. And that's why I don't look at that as like, oh, yeah, they can beat the Bengals in December. Yeah. Because, again, we're talking about a team that's feeling good about their sales and their progress. Not a team that's like, man, we're supposed to go to the Super Bowl this year, and we're 3-13, and 13 or we're 3-10. and 10. Yeah, that's true, because when, you, when you're playing the Cowboys, you know that's one of those teams with a lot of those young guys, like you point out, that are trying to show something. And you know Joe Burrow as a rookie is going to want to win. And he looks – I mean, he to me, he's a guy who's transforming that organization. I mean, he looks good. So – I mean, he looks like the guy, and we'll see. But first impression, man, he looks like the guy. He does. You know, and if Joe Mixon can get healthy because he's been out, he didn't play this week. And then, you know, T. Higgins looks like he's got a little something. A.J. Green is a shell of what he once was. He is no longer like that guy. But, you know, now with Joe Burrow there, Tyler Boyd is coming along and showing some things. So they've got some pieces I'm not saying, obviously, a 2-5-1 and one, they're going to do anything this year, but that might be one of those teams, if he and Zach Taylor can hit it off and it feels like they have, that might be one of those teams that you sit there in the AFC North. Maybe it's not Cleveland in a couple of years. Maybe when Ben Roethlisberger walks away, it's Joe Burrow and the Bengals who are going to be bashing heads with Lamar and the Baltimore Ravens moving forward. I can see that, bro. I can see it. Although, to be fair, Cleveland, I think, won again today. And you look at the – well, no, they lost today. They lost today, 16-6 to at home. You know, Baker Mayfield, man, you talk about up and down. That dude was 12 of 25 for 122 yards today after – what was it, two weeks ago? Or no, it was last week he goes out and throws four, four touchdowns, whatever it was. Being consistently good is the hardest thing NFL quarterbacks have to do. That's very true. Mm. I mean, it just is. That almost seems somewhat deep. Being consistently good. So you guys got to realize we're recording this. It's almost 1 o'clock in the morning, and I think we get a little delusional at some point, and you say something like that, and my brain just goes, ah, yes. 
<laughs> you know, as I'm well, waiting I mean, you for. Know, you can get seduced by 300 yard games and five touchdown sure. performances, but can you give me 280 and three touchdowns every week? That's hard to do. I mean, if you look at Baker, Baker's got a lot of peaks and valleys in his game. A lot. A lot of highs, a lot of lows. You know, a guy like Ryan Fitzpatrick, one reason he's stuck around is he's got a lot of highs in his game, a lot of peaks. One reason he's played for eight teams is he's got a lot of valleys. <laughs> he's got a lot of peaks and valleys in his game. He's he's always finding it hard to be consistently good. Nick Foles, hard for him to be consistently good. Dude, it is hard to be consistently good, man. It is. And, and you know, you bring up Fitzpatrick, and he did not play today for Miami because we saw the debut of Tua Tagovailoa, the kid from Alabama that they had taken with the fifth overall pick this year in the draft. And, you know, Tua didn't have to do anything today. He threw for less than 100 yards on 22 passes, and the Dolphins won by double digits over the Rams because Jared Goff, Carson winced it today. How about that? The top two picks of the, of the what was that, the 2016 draft? The top two picks combined for eight turnovers today? <laughs> because Goff did exactly what Wentz did against the Cowboys. He threw two picks and fumbled the ball twice and basically gave the game to Miami. Now, Miami's offense was able to get points on the board and take advantage of those turnovers. They were up 28-10 to 10 at the half. I mean, this thing was a wrap because Goff couldn't get out of his own way. Uh, yeah. I mean, but that's that's what happens. Um. Uh, you know, we, there's still a lot of questions about those two guys, man. You know, are they solid NFL quarterbacks? Yeah, I guess. I mean, they used to be. <laughs> I think Goff still is, even though he's, you know, he's the puppet master's quarterback uh, in Sean McVay. Yeah. But, you know, we still got questions about Wentz now after, after what we saw today in uh, Philadelphia against Dallas. So, dude, when, when, when you have these things, Goff – I mean, I'm shocked that that Goff got the money he got. I'm sure Philadelphia has buyer's remorse. And I wonder if that's why the Cowboys look at it and go, well, damn, these guys aren't what they thought, even regardless of the money. And if it plays some role in Dex negotiations. Yeah, I mean, maybe it does. But, you know, at the same time, for all those people who like to to get all pissed off about Dak and like, oh, we shouldn't pay him or do any of that thing, I go, look at the money that Goff and Wentz got. And you look at the way those guys are performing and the turnovers they have, their teams, and I get it, Dallas hasn't had any real success with Dak either. And that's fair. It's not like they're going to a Super Bowl like Goff did with the Rams. But I, I think when you look at the individual play, I think right now, had he not been hurt, I would say right now Dak Prescott is the better of those three quarterbacks. Yeah, I mean, you get some disagreement, but uh, no, I think unbiased answer is, yeah, he is. I mean, it's not like Jared Goff doesn't have weapons. They've gone out and gotten him all kinds of stuff and tried to put things around him. The thing about Dak is, and it's what it's juxtaposed with, with Wentz, is Dak has continued to get better every year. While Wentz looks like, I mean, he's declining this year. He had yes. three terrific years. Mm. Previous three years, 81 TDs, 21 picks, and now all of a sudden he's 12 picks in one year. I mean, that's damn near as many as he th- – as more than half of what he threw in the last three years. And so at one level, I often wonder, you know, guys have career years. It just means it's the best year of your career. Yeah. Uh, but every player also has a career low, and that's why you have a full career. Uh, because it's the you know it's the average of what you do between your, the years that you play, right? And so I just wonder if this is just happens to be Wentz's year where he hits you know two oh five with fourteen homers and twenty seven ribbies. It's it's just an aberration. Maybe it is. I don't know, but he has not been good and and wasn't good today. Goff wasn't good today. You know another team. And I don't know what to think about this team. There's a few teams like this in the NFL. Chicago is one of those teams to me. I have a hard time buying into Chicago because of Nick Foles. We kind of know what he can do. He's always been that guy who can come in and give you like a chunk of time. But over the course of a whole season, I, I don't know that he's going to be the answer in Chicago. Now, they did lose today, but they lost in overtime to a Saints team most people think is pretty good. They're 5-3. and three. Right. There's a team like that in the AFC, and it's the Indianapolis Colts who throttled Detroit today 41-21. to 
Phillip Rivers was good through three touchdowns, no picks. The Colts are five and two. Interesting team. They just they just make it happen, man. <laughs> like they're not flashy, but they get it done. And sometimes that's enough, man. They got a lot of uh they play a good defense with Eber who used to be in Dallas. Yeah. Um I I I check this out, man. Like I ain't trying to watch the Colts play, but they do a good job. <laughs> yeah, and it, it's you know, they play in a division because Houston and Jacksonville are so bad. It's between them and Tennessee. They're both five and two. And with seven teams making the playoffs, you know, that was kind of the thought as Phillip Rivers goes back, he gets repaired with Frank Reich up there in Indianapolis. He'll be playing indoors. They've got some good weapons for him. If he could just stop turning it over, and we've seen that with them so far this year. He has those games. You know, Phillip Rivers is still that guy that'll turn it over two or three times every once in a while. You know, right. but when he plays like he did today and they're able to run the ball with Wilkins and Taylor and, and you throw in Naheem Hines and – I don't know. That's one of those teams. I don't know. It, it, it feels to me like Kansas City and Pittsburgh are the class of the AFC. I don't know quite what to make of Buffalo. I don't know that a team that's 6-2 and two but has a minus one point differential, what that means, <laughs> like Buffalo does. But, you know, Buffalo is doing what New England had done for many years, which is take advantage of playing in a weaker division, except Buffalo is taking advantage of the fact that it's the Jets – and the Patriots are in their division, and the Patriots aren't any good this year. Dude, the Patriots have been winning a lot the last couple of years. To me, on uh, mystique and understanding how to win. And you're like, really? Yeah, yeah. I mean, they understand, like, oh. I mean, that's why they score so many special teams touchdowns and defensive touchdowns. They, they, they're masters at it, but they were really stealing wins along the way. It wasn't because they were so much better than people. And then people didn't expect to beat them when they played them. Right. Well, dude, that cloak of invincibility has been ripped off because now people look at them like they don't have any playmakers on offense. No, they right. don't. And, and, and Zero. Cam's trying to do the whole thing himself, and he can't. And, and he has really struggled the last couple of weeks. He has not been good. He fumbled the day that, that killed it and, and won the game for Buffalo. But New England's 2-5. and five. So, you know, almost like the Cowboys. Cowboys are slightly worse at two and six. I'll tell you one team that is kind of surprising, though. We already talked about them a little bit. But when you when you kind of look through where everybody is sitting seven, eight weeks into the season, you realize the Miami Dolphins are four and three? And a whole bunch of draft picks, bro. Dude, and they have a plus 58 point differential. Uh, you know, Flores is building something down there, man. They are on the right path. It's going to be interesting with Tua taking over – they won today, and like I already told you, I mean, he didn't even throw for 100 yards, but that was one of those things where it felt like all along that must have been the plan with Tua getting to your bye week and we're going to make the move to him because Fitzpatrick and the Dolphins had been 3-3. Three and three. They hadn't been playing bad. Right. Now they've won three in a row, and be curious to see, you know, Buffalo or Miami. I think Buffalo's probably a better team than Miami is right now, but uh, that's the one team I think out of the entire league when you look at it. I don't know if I would have had them as a playoff team this year. I think they're still building something. Whereas a team like Arizona, who's five and two, I thought had a really good shot to surprise some people and and be competitive in the West. And right now they are. So we'll see. Yeah, and they can they can really take a step forward, man, because they've got Houston's first round pick. And check this out: they don't need a quarterback. So That's right. That's right. The higher that pick goes, while everybody else is 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 trading up to get quarterbacks. They can sit right there and let one of the best players in the draft, regardless of position, fall right to them. And now, of course, it is the time that I know many of you have been waiting for. The time that you look forward to. You have made it to the point in the podcast where we bring you secret audio of a Cowboys homer. The recordings of me watching the Cowboys and whatever crap that was they threw out there against the Eagles tonight. And I got to tell you, I, I don't know. I've been tired today because we had a lot of fun for Halloween. You and I were on the ticket for three hours earlier today. So, you know, my Dude, voice is tired. Does that feel like a lifetime ago? It does. It really <laughs> does. And it was earlier today for us recording this on a Sunday. You know, but it's one of those things where... You also have to recognize that I don't have a lot of hope for this team. Like, I'm still there. I'm still a fan. And then I start watching the game, and I realize, okay, there's there's still a little bit of that passion coming out, you know. Right. 
<laughs> I knew it. I'm not surprised. I knew it was there. I man. know. Your passion bucket is not empty. And uh, we'll start you off with this clip. And th- this is the passion for this defense on Boston Scott and Philadelphia's first carry of the game here. Oh, my God. He goes right up the field. First carry of the game, 20-plus yards. This defense is horse <laughs> That's incredible. <laughs> well, if you're going to keep the same damn defensive coordinator, guys, it's going to continue to happen. They don't care. <laughs> oh, he got jacked. Oh, he bubbled it. Oh, my God. Carson Wentz is horrible. How do you do that play? Oh, my God. Well, I mean, what are you doing? God, he's dumb. That's just a dumb play. <laughs> so, yeah, apparently, you know, you get a little bit. Of, and I I couldn't. I mean, come on. Now, the Cowboys run defense was better as the game went on. But, you know, that first carry that Boston Scott had, and he takes it for 19 yards. And I'm just going, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> I mean, it was, uh, I was, at that point, it had me scurrying around looking because I thought it was 20 yards, which meant they'd have been tied with uh, Cincinnati for the most 20 yard runs get allowed this season at 10. Jeez. So we will go from that one to the next one. And I've got this one. This is when Danucci takes a sack and they have to set, settle for a field goal that, that was earlier in the game that put them up 3 nothing. Yeah, it's just cool. We're going to see all these weird ass plays tonight, apparently. Get rid of the first down. Wow. Okay. All right. Just kind of sling it over there. That works. Watch him take him right down the field and score a touchdown. That'd be something else. Yeah, really. Would or get be. sacked. God, Jesus. Dude, get rid of the ball, man. God, look at that ball. That was weird. That was wobbling all over the place. They have a lead. How about that? Awesome. Three nothing. <laughs> See, and that's about – that's what's so crazy is that you're like, okay, I mean, I, I should be happier because they just – they took the lead 3 nothing, but I, I, it, to me it's like it doesn't mean anything. You can't be. <laughs> because, you know, man, it's the NFL. You know their offense is trash, and you know three points is not going to be enough to win. Yeah, yeah that's, that's kind of where that feeling came from. So we go from that one – and the sack that led to the field goal to the next time that Danucci would do something, and this is when he has a fumble. Get rid of it. Oh, he's going to get jacked. Yep, sure did. Fumbled it. They got it back. No, the Eagles got it. Yeah, Eagles got it, I think. You need it. God damn it. Jesus. Yeah, they got it. <laughs> man. God, you knew it was going to happen. You, you so got to get rid of the damn ball, dude. Oh, that sucks. <laughs> <laughs> Knock their quarterback, get a fumble, then give it right back to him. Typical. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what to say. <laughs> it's the pain, man. It's, that's what it's like cheering for a team. It's I thought pain. that was awesome, though, where I'm like, I'm like, yep, there it is. Sack, fumble, cool. Just matter of factly, because we've seen it so many times. Dude, they fumble more than anybody else in the league. God, so bizarre. And it's just so, just it's some of the stuff, when you see it week in and week out for eight games, you just want to pull your hair out and scream. I can only imagine what McCarthy is feeling like. So we go from that one to the Eagles having recovered that fumble, and this is my comments kind of condensed here as they make a drive down the field to score. And it's an easy first down as he runs right by Jalen Smith. Went right by him. <laughs> he That's did. one of those Jalen just turning around, running up the field with the guy. And he goes right by Jalen Smith. What are you doing? God. Great. Now an offside. Good job, Jalen. Gives him a first down. <laughs> You're not on the fly anymore, dude. Season's gone. Too easy. Right over Diggs. Too easy. Oh, so much for the lead. It'll be 7-3 to three here momentarily. Easy, wide open. No, he didn't. Oh, they're going to say he got in. I thought Diggs actually made a nice play on that. Sucks. Oh, there goes the game. 7-3, <laughs> game over, friends. Right down the field, no resistance. It's true, well, though. I you're mean, not wrong. You know. You knew it. You could see it. You could feel it. And I think that's one of the frustrating parts about watching these games is that 3 nothing. I had zero doubt in my mind that Philadelphia, they would just go down the field and make it 7-3. to three. 
the games are the games are playing out in a certain way this particular year for the Cowboys. Uh, they didn't give them, uh, you know, the the turnovers that led to points early. Uh, so you know, the, this was this was a uh, this was a game to me where you know Philadelphia is still even better. You know how you can tell they're better? Yeah, because they gave up four turnovers and still won by two touchdowns. <laughs> That's true. That's how you know they're better. So we will continue here on Secret Audio of a Cowboys Homer. And this is one where it's ba- it's basically just failed Cowboys. It's a drive that does nothing. They go three and out, and here's my displeasures. Look at Sean Lee's looking at Jalen Go well, Jalen was over there just running around watching guy run right by him. Look at Sean. He's talking to Jalen. He goes, Jalen, stop watching people run right by you. <laughs> Please. And Jalen's like, I mean, clear eye view, man. Wow. <laughs> God. <laughs> As soon as they give him the ball, he's tackled for a 4,000-yard loss. That time he gets out of there. Just get rid of the ball. Holding. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. He just floated that. I mean, you might as well just choose which defender you were hoping to pick that. God, this team sucks. I mean, you've called on the Lord more than anybody I've heard recently. I know it really. I've I've really been trying to get them involved in this and, and hoping <laughs> that they've got to be up there watching, you know. And, and they can't believe it. They can't believe what they're seeing. I mean, there used to be a hole in the roof, so God could watch his team play. He probably wishes that there was was no hole in the roof now. <laughs> Ridiculous. So we go from that, and this is one. Oh, I might be a little excited here because this is when Carson Wentz fumbles yet again. Yeah. Uh. Right when you think you get them off the field, they go for it on fourth and three. Oh, he got jacked and he fumbled it. And they got it. Oh, that was awesome. Oh, they got popped. That is big right there. I mean, Leighton Van Der Esch just ripped him in half. God, that was f***ing awesome. Look at that. And Wentz is like, God, why do I suck and fumble all the time? Badass. <laughs> See, I was excited on that one. Yeah, you think? That was a good one. All right, so we will go from the wince fumble here as we navigate our way through this game and my comments on how it played out as it as it was happening. And this is one where, uh, well, more more Ben DiNucci fail. Right when you think you get them off the field, they go for it on fourth Oops, and three. Wrong one. Try this one. All right, let's see if Ben can take them down the field. Another. Oh, a fake double reverse. Oh, that was cool. That was cool. <laughs> God, they are doing, I mean, trick play after trick play. Oh, no. Don't pass it. Oh, God. Oh, no. What in the world was that? <laughs> Somebody needs to tell him you're not playing football in your front yard. This is an actual NFL game. <laughs> now you got to pass it. Let's see what floater he throws up this. Oh, my God. Massive false start. Third and 14. Hadn't done any good. How's it, Al? <laughs> now we're going to throw it. Cedric Wilson wanted to pass it, and there was nothing there. So, punt. <laughs> Dude. Oh, I love how I talk to the announcers. Yeah. I, I'm still trying to figure it all out myself. I have multiple comments in every game where, because you guys are like, why are you just talking out loud to yourself? And sometimes it's my lady friend, but a lot of the times it's me talking to the announcers. <laughs> hey, whatever works for you. Bro. And I know they can't hear me. It's the craziest thing. All right. Whatever works for you. So we will move along here, and this next cut is the first Trayvon Diggs interception. Oh, then Wentz, of course. Wentz does what Wentz does. Yeah, that's a pick. God, Wentz is not good. His knee's down. Yeah, his knee's down. He picked it. Thanks, Wentz. God, Wentz is bad. (laughs) Why would you throw that pass? It's right on the line, though. He's down. That's a pick. That, that's a shin. It's down. What do you mean it's not clear and obvious? What body part do you think that is? God. Obviously. What is happening? What body part do they think that is that touches before his knee touches? It's a shin. He's down. <laughs> I don't know. Wow. Again, that's me. Arguing with the announcers. They seem to take you seriously, though. 
Al Michaels and Chris Collinsworth. And then the guy comes on there. He's like, I can't tell. I was like, what do you, you got to be kidding me. It's obvious that his shin had touched the ground before his knee did. It was obviously a pick. Oh, absolutely. We go from that one to what is next? Oh, the second Diggs interception. Here we go. Going deep. God, what a horrible pass. And another pick by Diggs. Sweet. And he gets up. He's going to run it all the way back. <laughs> God, that was nice. What a god awful pass by Wentz. I mean, my God, that's a horrible pass. Well, it's true. It was. I was excited on that one. <laughs> There's some positivity in this. It's not all bad. I mean, they're two and six with a three game losing streak. It's going to be a lot of bad, bro. I know. And, and I think that's why, like, I see, like, little cool plays like that or a nice interception and I get a little excited. But it, it's not. What's funny is it's not as, as excited as it was a few weeks ago or even like last year watching these games because it just felt like they meant more. And now you're kind of like, oh, that's. I mean, that's neat. It's cool. That, that was awesome. But still, what's it really mean? Yeah, exactly. And so then this is the next one here, I believe, is the missed field goal with that stupid play call that we were talking about earlier of why they did that. I mean, after what Danucci showed you in the first half, why would you pass ever again? <laughs> Let Pollard carry it, then bring in Zeke, and they rest up and just keep doing this right down the field. You don't, you don't need to trick it up. Oh, my God. Now they're, they wanted to do that pass. Why would you do that? <laughs> You've been running right up the middle of the field with effectiveness, and then you call that dumbass play. <laughs> that just doesn't make any sense to me. It didn't make God, any sense man. to anybody. That's just a dumb f***ing <laughs> play call. What do you think he's going to do? That Cedric Wilson is going to throw you a, a bomb touchdown pass? That was dumb. Now it's third and 18. Now you have to pass. He's probably going to throw a pick. Nope, because they don't throw a pass the line of scrimmage, and you kick a field goal. <laughs> Unbelievable. <laughs> I mean, this dude is your game MVP right here. Oh, he way missed that. You got four turnovers. You have nine points on four turnovers in this game. Incredible. I thought that was funny. I go, because they march out Zerline, and I'm like, oh, this is the MVP of the game, and right after I said that, he misses the field goal. Yep, from 52. And that <sighs> close. That's tough, though, man. That was that was a long I – mean, what are you going to do? It was windy. He nailed the 59-yarder. That was cool. All right, we got a couple of more here before we wrap things up on Secret Audio of a Cowboys Homer taking you through the game. And this is when the Cowboys fail on that fourth down call. Yeah, that worked nice. Going for it again. Why not? Don't do anything dumb. And he did something dumb. God, and they still didn't get a pick. <laughs> Incomplete. Eagles ball. I can't believe this dude hadn't thrown a pick. <laughs> and now he has. Dude, I was sitting there. You have to You have to have been thinking that when you're watching Ben DiNucci and some of the passes he threw today. I was like, I cannot believe that he did not throw an interception. Well, as I told you, one from lack of effort, he probably had probably four to five interceptable passes. Easily. Easily. All right, couple more, and this next one is the fumble that he had that Philadelphia scores on that basically iced the game for the Eagles. Got him. Oh, don't fumble it. Oh, God, he fumbled it. <laughs> Gave it right to him. Oh, great. They're going to pick it up and run back and score a touchdown. Ball game. All right. That's fine. God, at least <laughs> Zeke's trying to get there. God, man. How do you – yeah, unless they say that Eagles dude had possession when he was on his back, then it doesn't look like he did. It looks like they're – see, right there, they're fighting for it. Yeah, and that pops out. That's a touchdown. Is that as fast as Danucci can run? <laughs> oh, <laughs> probably so. I don't know, man, but I noticed on that, you know, I'll give some props to Zeke there because Zeke went after that dude. He didn't get him. He caught him when they were close to the end zone, but nobody else other than Zeke took off after that, that dude who picked it up and ran it in. Nah, he ran it all the way, dude, the whole 50, 60 yards. Yeah, uh, and then he was yeah. So I mean, that was a good that was a good effort, man. And it then was an effort worth pointing out as the uh, NFL's highest paid running back, second highest paid running back. Indeed, yes. So I guess he gets paid for the effort. So we appreciate that, Zeke. But we'll wrap yeah. it up here as we always do. There wasn't a lot of random audio tonight, but I was able to uh, ob uh, ob obtain a few of my random cuts. So here is the random parts of the thoughts that spew out of my brain when I'm just talking out loud watching a game. Which makes no sense because why would he have candy? He can't eat it. He doesn't have a face. 
<laughs> it's like the worst news of all time. Like, oh, hey, we're transferring you to Philadelphia. And you have to go live in Philadelphia. Like, why is Chicago the town where all these shows are? I think that's odd. How come they don't do Dallas Med? The Schwartz is with you. Yeah, so there it is. Really quick today. Really quick on that one. But you got a few cuts. You know how it is. These late games, man. These late nights. I tell you. Painful, brother. They are. They are. You start feeling it a little bit. You definitely start to feel it a little bit. But hopefully everybody enjoyed that. We will have another podcast ready for you on Wednesday morning and Friday morning this week. Keep in mind, we will be out at Oak Highlands Brewing on Friday. It was really cool. Had a few people that came out last Friday, and that was cool. And many of you that watched on our YouTube Live. So keep that in mind that we do have our YouTube channel, and we'll post podcasts, and we'll have our YouTube YouTube live out there at four o'clock on Friday at Oak Highlands Brewing in the Lake Highlands area off of Miller and 635. And you can subscribe by searching Jam Session Podcast on YouTube. But thanks for listening to the Jam Session Podcast. Find us on YouTube. Find us on Instagram at Jam Session Cast. And of course, on Twitter at McMatt Radio at JJT underscore journalist. Our director of creative content is Brian Hart. Thanks to Purple Elephant Music for the music you hear at the end and beginning of each episode. He's the radio and TV star, the sexy Jean-Jacques Taylor. And I'm just a guy, Matt McLaren. Please remember to subscribe and rate and review the podcast, and we'll catch you next time on Jam Session, available everywhere you listen to podcasts.